yesterday. Before we get started um, on the main content, a couple of things first. Uh, the website is working now. The slides are not up yet, but they will be. Uh, they're very large files. I need to make them smaller, <laughs> uh, but they, they will be. But what's up there right now is a list of further reading and bibliography that um, you can consult, but I will put the slides up, I promise. Uh, next, um, if any of you are thinking, wow, I wish I could go to lectures about ancient Egypt all year round, not just January, I've got great news for you. You can. Um, we're very lucky in Cape Town to have the Egyptian Society of South Africa. They do many, they have many activities, uh, but they have monthly lectures, they have a whole celebratory day school in July on a different theme every year. Um, and so I encourage you to go to their websites uh, and check them out. And there's Jean right there in the second row. Um, I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Ria, Ria. Ria right. Um, and Jean is the president of the society. She will happily chat to you about it afterwards. Uh, so please find her, go check out uh, the website, um, and so on. Uh, also, I mentioned yesterday uh, something about Eziko, and I heard a lot of kind of surprise, Eziko. Uh, what's, what's with that? Well, Eziko has uh, a collection of Egyptian antiquities, and just a couple of months ago, they opened a new exhibit uh, in cooperation with the Friends of Design, a design school in Cape Town, uh, and this uh, reopening of the exhibit um, involved putting out some new artifacts, rearranging them, completely updating the presentation. Um, I worked with Eziko on this, and then also adding a virtual reality component, uh, rather I should say an augmented reality component. Um, so it's, it's really, really, it's aimed at you know, kids but also uh, adults and I would definitely urge you to go check it out. The, um, and the um, augmented reality component with the tablets there uh, was actually sponsored by the Egyptian Society of South Africa. So, um, you know, go out, support ancient Egypt in Cape Town, show Eziko that they should keep this exhibit going because it's, it's always a question mark whether or not to keep the Egyptian artifacts on display or take them off. So uh, the more people who go to see it, then um, the greater the likelihood that they will remain on display. Um, okay, so uh, I thought what I would do today is um, focus mostly on the hieroglyphic system. But before we get to that, before we get to the kind of the basics of how it works and the orthography and all of that, I just wanted to review again the basic scripts. Uh, so there's, of course, hieroglyphic. Um, then there's hier hieratic. And note that hieratic almost entirely overlaps with hieroglyphic in terms of its time span, right? And then we also um, were introduced to demotic last time. Uh, and then also Coptic. And in terms of their uses, I'm going to go into a bit more detail about this tomorrow when I talk about genres and types of writing and what the Egyptians wrote down. Uh, you know, just, just keep in mind the kind of general points. Um, and I'm, I am sorry about the darkness of the slides. We tried to fix the lights, but it's either this or no lights. There's no damning capacity. So uh, I encourage you to go look at the slides later on on your computer or phone. They'll be brighter there. Um, so hieroglyphs are used. Um, uh, typically on walls of temples and walls of any type, walls of tombs, obelisks, um, statues, uh, coffins, sarcophagi, stelae, uh, labels, dedications, um, all those kind of things in a, in a more formal capacity. Uh, and uh, they could also be used for historical and autobiographical texts. We'll see that more tomorrow uh, to record speech. They can also be used on papyrus sometimes, uh, and we'll see that more tomorrow, but predominantly they're used on stone and hard objects. 
Um, in order to, or I should also point out, the reason I put this one big front and center is that hieroglyphs, you know, as writing and on monuments, they have power, right? They're images, they have power. Um, and that's why if you go to Egypt, you'll occasionally come across hieroglyphs and symbols that have been carefully hacked out. And that is done to eliminate their power. In the case of this image, this was an image of Hatshepsut, right? The female king. Uh, not everyone really liked the fact that she was a king. Uh, so after her death, there was a concerted effort, at least with some of her monuments, to hack out not just her person, right? But her names um, and her, some of her epithets. Uh, just those ones, not the names of the gods or anything else, because uh, that would be sacrilegious, just hers. So there is this kind of powerful element to uh, hieroglyphs once they're carved in the materials, uh, these hard materials. Now, as I'm sure you can imagine, having to carve out hieroglyphs or even draw them out gets a little tiresome. So uh, Egyptians thought so too, very quickly, uh, in, their, in their history of writing. So they developed a more cursive version called hieratic. Uh, which is not to be confused with cursive hieroglyphs. I'll introduce you to that t tomorrow. It's confusing, but hieratic is its own script. Um, and uh, even though it's its own script, what I wanted you to note on this slide is that it does, each sign does have a one-to-one -one equivalent, right, in printed hieroglyphs. Uh, so you can take just about any hieratic text and you can transliterate it back into hieroglyphs um, if you had to. Uh, I had to when I was learning this in graduate school as part of my exam. Um, I couldn't do it today, at least not without a lot of help. Um, but uh, so I just wanted you to kind of to see the connection and you can recognize maybe some of the symbols, right? Like maybe you can see here that this is a seated man, right? With a head, arms, knees, legs. Um, this one isn't there, but this is the leg with a foot. It's a symbol for the letter B, what we call the letter B. Um, so you can make, you know, the you can, if you look closely enough and start learning it, you can see the connections. So that's hieratic. And of course, hieratic was used to write all kinds of stuff, day-to-day -day contracts, letters, uh, literature, um, all sorts of stuff. And it was written predominantly on papyrus, but um, sometimes other materials uh, as well. Then, of course, we have the Demotic and Coptic. We saw these a bit yesterday. Demotic is an even more, it's not maybe not accurate to say a more cursive version. It's a, more sh it's a shorthand. Uh, even kind of more abbreviated version of um, hieratic. Uh, by the time Demotic is introduced, the language has evolved quite a lot. Um, it's written both in monumental contexts, like, um, like the Rosetta Stone and on, on stone, also in very casual, informal contexts. On the left is a piece of pottery, a broken piece of pottery, uh, which someone has written a note on. Broken pottery was like the scrap paper of antiquity, and they would paint on it and use it, right? They would reuse stuff. Uh, so that's a note, you know, or some, um, uh, some sort of instruction or list on there. It's very difficult. One of the challenges with writing demotic is that demotic is basically handwriting, right? So if hieroglyphs has standardized forms, uh, standardized or orthography early on, demotic is much more like our modern handwriting. And so the biggest challenge to learning demotic is not the grammar, or even the letter forms, per se. It's the handwriting, because everyone has a different, every scribe has a different handwriting. And that's why it's one of the least published of all the groups of documents, um, because of that difficulty. And I'm sure, looking at it, you're thinking, wow, how do they even make sense out of all that? How can you even guess that this is originally from hieroglyphs? But, you know, I would, I'd love to show you some of my students' exam books, um, if you want to see like difficult to read stuff. And this is example. This is English, believe it or not. Um, so it really is. I promise. Um, you can see right here. I don't know. Um, so so you can kind of you can see right like why demotic then kind of looks the way it does. Why why someone could how someone could read it right. Uh, so this is that's a challenge uh, for um, you know for us probably for them too. Uh, then, of course, we have the Coptic, which I mentioned yesterday, but I wanted to show it to you. Uh, it's only, you know, it's not quite as related as a script to the others because, of course, it's adapted from Greek. But it does have a few, oops, uh, a few extra signs um, added in, taken from Demotic, because Egyptian and Greek had different sounds. Uh, of course, since it's adapted from Greek, it writes the vowels, uh, so that's a big change. Uh, and 
Uh, as mentioned in the Q&A yesterday, it's believed that a big reason for the adoption for, for this change, a shift from Demotic to Coptic, is that uh, Christian Egyptians were not comfortable with using an iconic-based script. Um, now that said, uh, pagans used it too. Um, so that might see, as we'll, we'll see an example later, that might suggest that it, just, it becomes popular, or maybe our reasoning is flawed. Um, but that's the conventional uh, wisdom. So, right, sorry that this isn't better, it's the best I could do, but I wanted to just give you an example. You can see kind of like how the transmission worked over the many, many centuries, right? So I pointed out this, the leg foot before as the letter B. Um, you can see it going from the uh, hieroglyphic to the hieratic to the demotic, um, you know, and so on. Uh, so, but I wanted to see how, the, I wanted to show you how they're connected. And that, you know, this is why when anyone's basically learning Egyptian, uh, Egyptian language, Egyptian writing, they almost always start with the hieroglyphs because that's the source, right? That's the source of these later scripts. So you might as well start with that if you want to understand um, how it is the Egyptians conceived of writing their language. So uh, that's what we're going to do too. We're going to go over the hieroglyphic writing system, orthography. That's basically, orthography is how we spell a language. Um, first though, it's good to know uh, about uh, Egyptian as a language and where it fits in right, with other languages. And they think this came up in the Q&A yesterday. Also, Egyptian is part of the Afro-Asiatic language family. Um, it is connected to languages on both sides of the, both branches of those, uh, especially in the African side to the Berber's language. Sorry, this is in German, by the way, uh, but I, it's the best illustration I could find. So I hope, uh, you know, it's, it's close enough, right? Um, uh, so uh, there, it's related to the Berber language. It's also related to uh, Beja. I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly, but that's part of the Cushitic branch of the whole family. It's also got connections to Hebrew and, and um, Aramaic and um, Arabic, but you can see by the color scheme, it's its own thing. Uh, it's got similarities to these, but there's enough kind of differences that it's got its own branch. Um, one, the thing it has especially in common that you need to kind of know for today is using um, a consonantal root system as the basis of the morphology of the words. And if all those things I said didn't make sense, it's okay, we'll come back to it. Um, Okay, so hieroglyphic is a logographic system, okay? So a logogram is a sign that represents a word or a phrase. It's also, you can also use the term ideogram, right? Uh, it means, you know, idea writing. Um, logograms are at the root of almost all early writing systems, right? Chinese, Mayan, um, uh, what else am I thinking? Oh yeah, in, in early cuneiform uh, as well. And but no logographic system is consists solely of logograms. None of them. Not Chinese. Not Mayan. Not uh, cuneiform. And not Egyptian. They all uh, make use of phonograms, right? So phonograms are symbols that represent specific sounds, right? So sound writing, literally. Um, now they might be used on their own or they might be used as a complement to the logogram to clarify its pronunciation, if you will. Uh, you know, in Chinese, how many, is anyone at all familiar with uh, Chinese hanji at all? A little bit, yeah, one person. So, and you know, in Chinese characters, the, the, uh, the, phonetic, the phonogram, the phonetic complement is often integrated with the logogram into a, a sign. Um, but uh, here, they're separate. So, it's, but it's not just logograms and photograms. We also have these signs that are we call determinatives. They're kind of like logograms, but they're, they have basically no phonetic value at whatsoever. Um, and they're, they're, not either, they're not necessary to the morphology of the word. Let me put it that way. They're used at the end to classify the word, to determine it, to let you know uh, which of the homonyms it is. Again, if that doesn't make sense, I'm going to give you a lot of examples, so it will by uh, the end. Um, actually, I have some examples here. Great. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, 
Uh, the one, the symbol I want you to pay attention to is that one on the right. Uh, it's a symbol for a house, right? And it's represented by a plan, a building plan. That's a room with a door. Uh, you're looking kind of from the top. And it uh, it's represents to, to, uh, by consonantal root, P-R, pair. Uh, and it can stand for house, right? It can be a, it can be a logogram right here. Um, it's also acting as a logogram here, pair nested, house of the king. Uh, it can also be then a phonogram, pair, meaning to go or merge. And that's because, we'll come back to this, uh, the word for go and the word for house in Egyptian are homonyms. So that's why you can use this symbol. Uh, here's another um, example where it's used again, parrot, growing season, also known as spring. Uh, same thing. It's a homonym, so it's being used. So we've got logogram, uh, phonogram, phonogram, and then I wanted to find an example when it's being used as a determinative and it's not part of the spelling at all. So this word is vocalized as uh, ashnuti. Again, remember it's all artificial, right? So don't worry about how I pronounce it. Ashnuti, and then you have this symbol at the end, it has no value, right? It doesn't correspond to any of this, but it lets you know that we're talking about a building or part of a building, right? It classifies the word as being part of architecture. Um, same thing here, wemut. And, and then this is a wemut, this is the part that corresponds to the, these consonants over here. And then this is just to let you know, again, we're talking about part of a building. Um, so we've got these three, three uses for hieroglyphs, or three kind of three different functions, right? Now, in theory, all hieroglyphs could function in all of these ways, but they don't. Uh, thank God, right? Um, pair is actually this one is one of the few that regularly functions as a logogram and a phonogram and a determinative. Most only function as one or two of these, uh, these uses. Um, right? Yeah. How do I know, or how do, they, or how do Egyptologists know? Um, well, the Egyptologists, they've studied these texts over upon text upon text and done the comparisons. And um, also then the comparisons with the Coptic, right, is where they get a lot of the um, word forms from. So they know that this is not supposed to be Ashenuti pair, um, it's just Ashenuti. That's how, through the... None of the characters are like a separator. Are like a what, I'm sorry? Separated between the two. So this is the, this is this one. This is this one, this one together is these two, this one is this one, and this, or oh, sorry, the T, this is the T here. So that's how, so we can break it down. We'll break, I'll break down some more later. Yeah, um, with um, the lines, it'll be easier to see. How do you pronounce that word there? What, this one? Well, let me come back to it, okay? Because I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna talk about pronunciation in a moment when, just worry about the, 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 the thing for now. The pronunciation, you shouldn't stress about the pronunciation. So that's the last thing you should stress about. <laughs> uh, you may be wondering how many hieroglyphs there are. Uh, a lot. Uh, but not, maybe not as many as you think. It depends. So um, in the Middle Kingdom period, the height of Middle Egyptian uh, literature uh, and so forth. There was about 500 that were commonly used, maybe, but then as many as 750 in total, but a lot of them are rarely used. Uh, a lot of them are kind of similar duplicates. It's not in the Old Kingdom, though, that they had about 1,000. And in the Greco-Roman period, it seems to get up to thousands, several thousand. Uh, they got a little inventive. Um, but some of them are very rare. Some of them are combinations. Some of them are alterations, you know, slight variations. There's a lot, you know, it's like any kind of system. Think about how complicated our spelling is now, right, o over time. So, but there, there's a lot, but um, when, if you study Middle Egyptian, uh, there's not, it's, it's not so complicated, and I'm gonna explain why. It's not as nearly as uh, intimidating as it might seem. Um, so, something that's important to understand about how this all works, and I've alluded to this several times, uh, is the question of, well, how do you go from a, logogram to a phonogram? How do you go from the 
word for a, you know, for a thing that you can draw and then use that for a totally unrelated item. Um, and it's what we call the rebus principle. And you can Google it and you find all kinds of um, examples, at least in English. Um, not that many, but a few. But basically, you can hear some, see some examples. Um, B plus a leaf for belief, right? I plus a saw, that's a saw, if you can believe that, uh, for I saw, depending, I guess, not if I pronounce it, but if someone else does. A seal, an ant for sealant, tree, a sun for treason. Um, and then in Egyptian, though, I think I mentioned yesterday, but maybe not yet, Egyptian doesn't really write down the vowels. So that actually gives you even more opportunities uh, for this kind of homonym. Uh, for example, here, cat and log, if you run to spell catalog, right? Uh, so, that's based, so that's the kind of core principle of how uh, it works um, in, in that respect, in terms of how these signs get to be used in different ways. Um, right. So, but let's talk a little bit about this continental aspect. So I mentioned these other logographic systems, right? It's Chinese, Mayan, cuneiform, um, Japanese also is a, a logographic system. But those are all logosyllabic, right? So each sign represents a syllable, uh, which makes it a lot easier from our perspective to pronounce. Um, but that's not the case for Egyptian. It's logoconsonantal. Uh, which distinguishes it. So remember, as I said, it was, it's related to these North, North African and West Semitic languages. And one of these commonalities is the use of the root system, a consonantal root system. Words have one or two or three root consonants. And the vowels change depending on the form of the word, whether it's a noun or a verb, a singular or plural, past tense or present tense. So the writing system that develops in Egypt then is similar to that that develops for Hebrew and Arabic in that vowels are de-emphasized or not written at all. Um, so, which makes a problem for vocalization, right? But for the reading, it's, it's not such a big deal because you, guys, you know that you don't actually need the vowels to read words, even in English, uh, because you know what the words are. It's, it's, it's hard for people who are non-native speakers, of course, uh, but if you were raised in the language, the vowels are actually just kind of extra. But we'll, uh, we'll come back to that also. Um, so let's focus right now on these phonograms and their consonantal roots. And we'll come back to this issue of vocalization. So you can divide up then our um, phonogram hieroglyphs, which is what we're going to focus on, into three categories. The uniliteral ones, which represent one sound, one consonant rather. Um, the biliteral ones, which represent two consonants, and the triliteral, three consonants. Let's look at the uniliteral ones. So, um, the uniliteral signs, uh, the so-called alphabet. If you Google Egyptian alphabet, this is what you're going to get. It's not really an alphabet, um, but that's how people tend to um, refer to it. Um, and this is what uh, Thomas Young and Champollion came up with, right, um, when they were deciphering things. So it's 20, ooh, I think it's 24 um, characters, 24 glyphs, and um, they're all consonants except for three. Um, well, kind of four. The one that is transliterated as a Y is a little bit like our Y, so it's kind of weak. It can sometimes do maybe double duty. Um, but those other three, the one at the top, the vulture, is translated as an Aleph. It was, a, it was a consonant, and then it kind of became very weak and fell out, and seems to have been replaced by some sort of um, glottal stop. So for transliteration, and this is purely a convention, it's just a convention, modern convention, it's transliterated as an, like an olive this, um, and this symbol. So um, that's that. And, for, um, and when Egyptologists are pronouncing words with it in there, they just use an A, like an A ah sound. Um, just, again, just convention. Now the other two, the reed leaf and the quail chick, which are transliterated usually as um, a J or an I. Sometimes you'll see that, but in this book it's a J. Uh, and then the quail chick is translated as a W. Um, these are both used as to show that there is a vowel present, but it doesn't tell you which one. Um, so, they, 
So the read leave can show it, uh, that a syllable began or ended with a vowel. The quail chick can be used as a consonant in its own right, the kind of W, um, or it can be used as um, a vowel indicator. Right. So just kind of be aware of that. But don't, like I said, don't stress. Now here's the good news. In Middle Egyptian kind of inscriptions, historical texts, and so forth, if you counted up all the different symbols, right, in a given inscription or a text, over 50% of them will be from this list. These are kind of, and I'm going to prove it, okay? So you'll see. But over 50% generally are going to be one of these 24. Now, it's not that, you know, it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean it's simple to read it. You still have to know the grammar and the spelling and all of that. But um, when you think, you're thinking 500, 750 signs, oh my gosh, half the signs you're looking at in any given Middle Egyptian text will be these. So learn these 24, and you're already halfway there, um, so to speak. Uh, and like I said, we'll come back to the vocalization in a moment. Um, let's look at biliterals and triliterals. So. Um, biliterals are basically what it says. You have a symbol and it stands for two consonants. A triliteral is a symbol and it stands for three consonants. Uh, and this is a root, right? Uh, so it's a root and it, it would be modified depending on the function of the word, if it's a noun or a verb, or if you make it plural, or if it give it an adjectival ending, or if you change its tense, um, or something like that. Uh, there's a fair more number of these, right? About 80 biliteral and about 70 triliteral. A little bit more harder to memorize, but it's, it's, not, it's not, not terrible. Um, think about, I mean, Chinese and Japanese in the, in the Hanji and Kanji, there's thousands, right? Um, I think in, I can't speak, I don't know about Chinese, but in Japanese, the, you're basically expected to know about 2,000, right? That's how, what will appear in a newspaper up to 2,000 different characters. So this is easy, right, compared to, to those. Um, just remember, though, that these are not syllables, right? These are consonants. Uh, a, a, tr a triliteral symbol could potentially represent three syllables. Um, a, tri a, a biliteral one could potentially represent two syllables, um, or not. But, um, so just remember that. Uh, you know, it's like, it's like English, right? Two consonants don't necessarily mean two syllables, right? We'll see. We'll see in a moment. Um, maybe right now. What's next? Okay, right. Uh, determinatives then in logograms. Uh, so if you have 24 uniliteral signs, about 150 biliteral and triliteral, that's all your phonograms. So 170 so phonograms, that means there's got to be a lot of determinatives, right? Yeah, um, there are. And here are just a, a few examples um, uh, of, of the many, um, ones that we're, I think we'll see in a moment. So for example, the papyrus scroll, used for, this is going to shock you, it's used for words having to do with writing, <laughs> but also thought, right? So a lot of abstract nouns will have the papyrus scroll as a determinative at the end. Uh, the forearm with a stick, <laughs> as it's described. Uh, it's a short version of the man with a stick. And it's often used with words of action, of doing. Um, and then the one below that is the determinative for mountain range. It's used for the word desert. Um, and uh, desert, foreign land especially, because why foreign land? Because the Nile Valley is a valley, right? And on either side are the mountains, and the foreign lands are beyond the mountains. So that's why. What are the numbers? Oh, that's just from the sorry, that's just from the sign list. So the, if you look in the back, um, hold on, I had one up here. So the standard sign list is Gardner's from Gardner's Egyptian Grammar. Um, I'll put. I don't think I've done it yet. I'll put a link. You can download it. I'll put a link on the website. Um, and you can see it's organized. So this is how you look them up. When you see a sign you can't remember, you, you look it up by category or by, I didn't put it up here. We'll see it in a second, or by shapes or shape. But um, they've all been divided by category, right? So these glyphs, they represent everything in the world. Animals, parts of animals, people, parts of people, uh, baskets, things, your house, every, you know, all kinds of things that they can imagine. Uh, so it's been divided up, and you created a sign list, and that's what Egyptologists have done. So that's what those numbers are. Right, so... Um, 
right, so um, I've been calling them determinatives, but also a lot of these function as logograms also. They stand in for the, they can stand for the thing that they are. How do you know when something's being used as a logogram and not a phonogram or a determinative? Um, a lot of the time, not all the time, there's an obvious way. Uh, the Egyptians used a little mark, a little kind of sideways, you know, upside, sideways dash, just this one stroke. Um, so for example, how do you know when the sun disk is being used to actually mean the sun as opposed to day or hours? Because that sun is used for timekeeping, words related to timekeeping and so on. You know because it'll have the stroke below it. But notice it's often written like this. That's the uniliteral sign for R. That's the uniliteral sign for Ein, right? So Ra. Um, Egyptians like phonetic complements. That's what they're called, phonetic complements. So even if they have the biliteral um, or whatever, they might actually use a uniliteral with it just to reinforce uh, the vocalization. Um, probably, you know, this might be for to communicate the vocalization correctly. It might also be for aesthetics, right? There's an aesthetic component to hieroglyphs. There's an aesthetic component to most writing. Um, so uh, there's a lot of, let me say, there's a lot of flexibility <laughs> in how things are spelled. Um, we saw a pair before. We know that it's the, been used here. It means house because it's got the little symbol of it. So in this word, um, nisut, this is the um, word for king, uh, pair, pair nisut. Incidentally, if you're ever wondering where the word pharaoh comes from, I'm just putting this up here for kind of trivia. Um, oh, sorry, it's misspelled. Wow, I'm supposed to say pharaoh. Um, it's a, uh, so pharaoh comes from the Bible, basically, right? It's the Hebrew version of an Egyptian word, para, which literally means great house. And they used it, um, it's often used in reference to the king because it's his residence, right? So they would say, oh, the great house has ordered. You know, the great house said this. Um, so that's where the um, word pharaoh comes from. It doesn't start showing up until the new kingdom, right? So before that, they're using different words for the kings. And they're still using this word for the king after. But then you also get this pair, ah, uh, ah. Uh. Um, but then notice also, that's how it's usually shown. And there's no strokes at all. It's been simplified, right? Uh, it's so common um, that they've just kind of gotten rid of the extra strokes altogether. Um, so there's rules, but you know the rules are flexible, right? There's, uh, you know, it's how it goes. Um, you know, and if those of us who, who, who for whom uh, English is our first language, we're not in any position to judge, right? Um, uh huh. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. And we all argue about when it's appropriate and not appropriate to use abbreviations, right? In formal writing all the time. Um, it changes, it's, it's constantly changing. Um, okay, so here, putting it all together, right? I think this maybe this is either gonna help or make, you, make it more confusing. I, I don't know, we'll see. Uh, hopefully it's gonna help. Um, Right, so what I've done here is I've taken two sentences. Uh, sentences. They're from actual um, text, but they're used in a textbook. And I've divided up the word groups um, for you so you can kind of see what's going on and how they connect. Uh, on the top one, that first combination um, is a negative, right? So it's a negative um, particle, if you will. Uh, so that's where the not is coming from, or no one in this case. The when um, is the rabbit with the, the wavy line is water, but it's a uniliteral sign for N. Um, so the, the wavy line for water underneath that rabbit, the rabbit is a, trend, is a biliteral meaning when also. So why do you have the extra N? In this case, it seems to be just a phonetic complement. Um, it also looks nice, right? So then when there is no one. It's a very common phrase actually. Uh, in a lot of Middle Egyptian texts. Uh, the next word, you have um, that fancy feather, uh, shu. And then that curly Q next to it is an alternate drawing for that quail chick, I know, I'm starting to lose you, uh, which was, um, which is uh, the letter W. It's indicating there's a vowel missing. 
Uh, and then you've got a determinative, the bird. Uh, there's so many different birds. I can't tell you which exact species this is supposed to be, but when I was studying the language, I always called it the bad bird because it's the bird that's used to denote negative things and negative characteristics. This is the word for enemy. Um, wait, is it? Sorry, now I'm questioning myself. Shoo, 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 shoo. No, I think, sorry, I take it back. This is not, sorry, forget what I just said. I'm pretty sure this is, it's free, and then that one's enemy. Um, the M is a preposition, in. Uh, it's also a uniliteral sign. And then you have um, the final word, uh, Harry, that which surely must be enemy in this case, because it has the man after it. And that's, in the, in the man determinative is used for people, individuals. Um, if you count up all the signs, then, and they're kind of what they're doing, what you have is you have seven uniliteral phonograms, three biliteral phonograms, three determinatives, um, that bird, which I now have to retract my identification of, but that bird, that man, um, wait, I said three. Oh, sorry, and the, the arm with the stick, uh, again. So those are all, those three are the determinatives, uh, you've got one triliteral phonogram, that's this upside down sphere. Um, and that's how the numbers break down. And so the reason why you have so many uniliteral phonograms is that the unil uniliteral signs are used for grammar, for things like prepositions, particles, um, pronouns, uh, and so on. And that's why you get a lot of them in these inscriptions. So here's another one. I'll try not to make a mistake this time. Um, the first sign, you've got two uniliteral signs, the reed leaf and the quail chick. So you conventionally pronounce you or you. It's totally, you can also say Jew. It's all artificial. Uh, it's a particle. So it doesn't, it isn't actually directly translated. Um, then you have, this is Garrett. You have a biliteral sign with a phonetic complement and uh, an ending um, tacked onto it. Uh, and this is the word moreover. So it's another, um, what's the grammatical term for these? Um, more, no, I guess it is a conjunction, moreover, because it would join with the previous sentence. Um, or it, it implies that there's a sentence before, right? not out of nowhere. Um, then you've got the verb, uh, wedge. Um, the N, again, is a tense indicator. It's, it has another, that's got a uh, grammatical function. Uh, this is the word for his majesty. Uh, you'll see it all the time, so it's a good one to learn. Uh, the F is, sorry, the snake, the serpent, is F. Uh, it's the pronoun, so his majesty. Pair, we've seen before. Um, go, and again, the extra R is probably here a grammatical function. Then R is also conveniently a preposition, meaning two. Uh, this is the mouth, by the way, um, the symbol for the mouth. And then you've got the symbol for a foreign country, a chaset, but with nothing else after it, right? So no stroke or anything, kind of by itself being a logogram all by itself. Um, and uh, why that, you know, you'd have to look at the original text. It could be orthographic reasons. You could be running out of space, right? Um, no, no, it happens, right? So you'd have to adjust. Um, but again, so you count it all up. You've got 10 uniliteral phonograms, three biliteral, two determinatives, two logograms, and one stroke. So that's what I mean when I say that, you know, over half of the symbols are going to be these uni uniliteral ones. So if you learn those and you start learning how it all works, it, it's not as formidable, right? Uh, this kind of 700 signs. Um, it starts to come together, but it takes a while. Um, I know, you're not convinced, but... How do you know that that's the desert and not the mountain? I mean, how does... So it's like, the, it's the same thing, basically, for them. Because the desert is the mountain. I know, it doesn't... I mean, like, not what? Here. Not, not here, here. But, not, but in Egypt. <laughs> um, the uh, Western desert, especially in Upper Egypt, it's almost immediately mountains and on the kind of eastern side too. And mountains, loosely speaking, right? Like I'm not talking the Alps, right? The, uh, the hill country 
if you will. So the Nile Valley, and then into the desert, and then it's, it gets hilly almost right away, at least in Upper Egypt. Lower Egypt's a different story, so, yeah. How do you know what part of the first sentence that the negation good is negated? Um, How do you know, like, enemy isn't being negated to be friend? A word order does matter, Okay. actually. Um, and since it's combined with the when, which is a verb, and then you get, it's, yeah. It's, um, also, I'm trying to think, do we, there is not, you're catching me on complicated grammar. Can you negate a noun? I don't know if you can. You're yeah, saying no, no more and more, yes. Right, but you're saying, because there's still a there is, is implied, right? There is no ball, there is a ball, right. as opposed to unball, right? <laughs> then they have negation of ball. Um, but yeah, but it's, no, it, it's a good question, but word order matters is the, is the, the big, the, the easy answer. <laughs> um, why did I put this up here? Oh yeah, you think it looks complicated, but guess what? English is super complicated too. Uh, English has phonograms that are made up of several characters, right? Vowels and um, consonants. Uh, these are just a few, right, that I just kind of thought of. Uh, there are many, many more. Uh, so, a, al, j, ch, d, o, thought, or no, sorry, a, ah, but that's pronounced in different ways, right? N, k, and i. Uh, spelled all kinds of different ways. So it seems natural. How many people are, in, are not native English speakers? And how many. Do, do you find English spelling like maddening? Yes. Uh, even the English, native English speakers probably find it. Just it's it, it just makes no sense, right? It's just not at all. Um, not only that, um, coming back to the issue of consonants. Well, the um, you know pro the problem for us and kind of you know I think really for some of you it seems really wrapping your head around the what's going on here is that there there aren't the vowels, right? So it's it's really hard to vocalize it. Um, which seems like a problem, but you know, from the Egyptian perspective, is it really? Um, you know, how how useful are vowels anyhow? Uh, certainly, even in completely phonetic languages, the vowel using the vowels, there's still a lot of pronunciation information that is left out, right? So you have things that are confusing, of course, right? So lead versus lead, and then the past tense lead. Um, students never, never get this right. It's a constant mistake. Um, but then also with words that look the same, so contest versus contest, right? Produce versus produce. Uh, and, and, and I'm not even talking about dialectic variations between you know, British and English or American English or South African English. Like even within the same dialect, there's a lot of information that's not communicated in systems that use vowels. So, um, you know, even in the so you know spelling, even in phonological systems, doesn't necessarily reflect actual pronunciation. So what do we have to do then with with Egyptian? Like as as I said, Egyptologists insert neutral vowel sounds in between, right? So I you know when I said hem f, right? Hem f, per er, um, and so on, just so we can communicate. That's all. Um, it's 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 all artificial. But I know some of you are really, really interested and concerned about what it actually sounded right, like, right? How do we know at all? Um, we have some clues. So for one thing, Egyptian words show up in other languages that do use vowels, right? Like Akkadian or um, Greek is obviously um, a big one. And of course then later on Coptic. So. Um, I hope this is clear, it may not be very clear, but what I'm showing you here is a late Egyptian magical text. Um, it's in the Egyptian language, but it's written using a very early form of Coptic. Um, so Greek letters with a few demotic letters. Now we can translate it, can transliterate it directly into our own characters so we can read it. And what we see is there, and this is, these are all the letters that are represented, right? Exactly. So there's some vowels, although some are still kind of missing, right? So you can kind of see there's a transition period going on a bit, perhaps. Um, but we have some of the vowels. So osro seb non enfar, shaft non ser, 
hand hand or something. I don't know. Uh, your guess is as good as mine. But we have a few more vowels than normal. The thing is, this first line is such a, what it's saying, its structure, and because it's a magical spell, it's very formulaic, it's very typical. We see it in all kinds of Egyptian spells that are written in hieroglyphs or hieratic. So we can reconstruct the, um, the original Egyptian hieroglyphs or hieratic and then transliterate it the way we normally would. So we found this in the hieroglyphs, it would look like this in our system of transliteration. Does that make sense? So now you can kind of see how it's coming, right? So remember how I said the W can be a stand-in for a vowel? Well, in this case, it seems to be the vowel O, Omicron. Um, that seems to be clear. Um, and in other cases, there's no indication that there's a vowel at all, because it's a sh probably because it's a short one, right? Um, short vowels are the easiest to leave out. Uh, it's the longer ones that uh, tend to get uh, more emphasized. So they put a, an E into here for a kefti, although there's no, interestingly, there's no vowel after the T, even though we would expect one. So I'm just putting this up here to kind of answer the question, how do we even go about figuring out what it might have sounded like? Or how do we know that some of these letters or that some of these hieroglyphs um, represent for vowels? And this is how, through a very tedious, painstaking comparison <laughs> with Coptic and words that show up in Greek um, and so on. Where do you get your uh -huh. series there? Where do you see the word? I can see it written there, but where is that in the top one? Um, uh, non sir. Is that your series? Yeah, so... Um, and that one? Yes, O-sir o is right here. N-O-sir. N... Yeah. Osiris, yes, exactly. Um, um, and you know, Osiris, that spelling in English uh, comes from, I think, the Latin, right? So it's been Hellenized and Latinized. And, and so, um, there was just saying I mean, the name. Um, and it's Osiris, and this, I don't know, this translation, a lot of Egyptian translations are unfortunately a little opaque, I think, to modern audiences. But um, <laughs> foremost of the West, Div, you know, foremost, you know, divinity, the, you know, he's the most important person in the West. If you're wondering why West, um, who knows why West? Why not East? West of Egypt. Yeah, West of Egypt, but what's significant about the West? Anyone? The sun sets. Yes, the sun sets, not just the sun sets, not just literally, but metaphorically on life, right? It's where they bury the dead. Um, so the, the afterworld is in the West. The afterlife is in the West. Um, so that's where Osiris is too. Um, that's all. So, okay, so let's see. Where are we? How much? Sorry. Yeah, uh-huh. What percentage of the population was literate? It's, it's debated. <laughs> we don't know for sure, right? No one, no one wrote it down, but presumably not very many. Um, like less than... 3%, 5%, Definitely, well, I shouldn't say definitely. No one thinks more than 10%. Um, literacy went up as time went on. So in the Greco-Roman period, you know, for the, this time, this period, it seems like it was higher. But in the earlier pharaonic period, five, two percent. But then what's liter? We have to ask, what do we mean by literacy? Someone, can, someone who can write their name, is that literate? Is someone who can write a few things or someone who can write like lots of texts? Presumably a lot of people can write a little bit. Um, but. I was really questioning how many people could read Oh, I mean, like, so this or the hieroglyphs? Let me go, let's look at the hieroglyphs. Um, the hieroglyphs, not so many. And in fact, what's interesting, another fun fact, is that the people who are actually carving it often couldn't read it. They just get a trans, you know, and we, see, and we know this because we can see the mistakes. They, what they do is they'll get a document in hieratic. They know the hieratic to hieroglyph conversion, and then they carve it in hieroglyphs, but they don't know what it says and they make mistakes, like they misread the sign. Um, and so you, uh, linguists have been able to figure out, they're kind of looking at things and they're like, this doesn't quite make sense. And then they realize, oh, they've written the wrong sign. So the presumption is that some of these guys who are carving it don't actually, they can't actually read it. Um, yeah. Oh, it's about power. 
<laughs> it's always about power, right? Um, yeah, I mean, the, the wealthiest, scribal schools were restricted to the wealthiest and the highest ranking, right? But there's some evidence that other people could learn, especially there's, you know, there's middle, we know some kind of middle estates, we'll look at some tomorrow, where, um, you know, they weren't from the, people weren't from the hot, richest families, but they could still write correspondence. Now, could they necessarily read this? Not necessarily, because remember, the hieroglyphs that are used on temples remain conservative, right? The language that is used on temples remains conservative. So while the modern, lang the contemporary language is moving on, the language that is used on temple walls is staying the same. Um, it's like, I mean, how many of us can read Chaucer, for example, or Old English? All right, that's well done. <laughs> then in the, uh, you know, in its, um, in its original, in the original, not the version you read in school where they, where they translated it into modern English. But there. Yes, no, exactly. It's um, and both for the, the language and the orthographic reasons. Um, so uh, so there, there, there's a lot of it going into that. Um, let me just try to get through a couple more things before the end. Oh, sorry. Uh huh. Why, why do you think that they, uh, that the carver, you know, say the neighbor, uh, the the Um, presumably because the priest who wrote it didn't want to bother and just wrote it out. Well, it's possible sometimes they were, but no, 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 I understand. It, sometimes they probably were. The reason they think they weren't is because sometimes there are mistakes that clearly show that the person misinterpreted the sign. And they did it, they wrote a similar sign, but the wrong sign. A similar looking sign, right? In terms of its form, but it's wrong in terms of the grammar. Right. All right, no, I, I take the point, and it may be, maybe we're wrong on that, but that's just the hypothesis. Um, so, sorry, but let's, I need to move on to <laughs> the rest of the stuff. So a couple last points about um, direction, about um, the writing system that's important. Uh, direction of writing, this was asked about yesterday. Uh, direction of the hieroglyphs is fairly flexible, although they prefer a right-to-left approach. But you could do it horizontally, you could do it vertically, you could do it left or right, depending on the context. Because when they're put on walls and things like this, they're part of a greater composition, right? They're part of what's going on with the scene. So, and a lot of times in these kind of images, they are, um, they are acting as captions, right? And when they're acting as captions, they're gonna follow the direction of the figures, right? So the ones that are describing this guy who's facing that way, the hieroglyphs are gonna face the same way as he. And um, likewise, this way. Also, they really like symmetry, right? So for example, a doorway at the Temple of Ramses at Medina Habu, um, if you look carefully, what you can see is that right in the middle, there's a split. So if you look at those two horizontal lines at the top, in the middle, the hieroglyphs, if, I mean, you, look, you can see the middle with the, the onk sign, the sign of life, um, and then they're facing this direction. Uh, and you can, you can always tell, always look to see which way the birds are facing, okay? Um, the birds are facing the direction you need to start. So if you're in the middle, you would read from left to right, from here to there. Um, or for this part, you would go from right to left. Um, so you read into the birds' heads. Right? You read into the people's heads most of the time, right? There's always an exception. Uh, there's a thing called retrograde hieroglyphs. Um, maybe I shouldn't tell you about them. When they deliberately do it, so you should read it the other way, but it's, it's complicated. Um, but in, in case there's someone out there who knows that, I just want to uh, point that out. But most of the time you read into the birds. So you can see here, right? These are actually mirror images of themselves, these two inscriptions, um, and you read so this one you read left to right, top to bottom. It's always top to bottom, almost always. It's always top to bottom. 
Um, the Egyptians played around with stuff, right? Why not? Um, but 99% oh, of the time, top to bottom, uh, and then left to right there, right to left. Same thing here, right? There's two different um, parts